Good morning, church family. Please stand with us as we sing our opening song.
Good morning. It's so good to see you here. Whether you're joining us here in person, joining on LLBN or online, we are so glad you've chosen to worship God together here. It is good to see you. And whatever you have been through this week, whatever has happened, you are here. I am here and we are getting the chance to celebrate and worship God together. Especially if you're a guest with us today. Maybe it's your first time, second time, third time. We invite you to take out this connection card from the pew in front of you. If you could just fill that out. There's through these doors and on the left there's a welcome center and there's a, a gift prepared for you. If you could just hand this to them. Or you're welcome to put it in the offering plate as it goes by. For those who are regularly a part of this community, we just love hearing from you. You share prayer requests, you share feedback and responses, ways that you long to get involved. And we pray over those and talk about those together as a staff. So feel free to communicate with us through that way. As you know, every single Sabbath here, we have food after this service. And today it's special because it's taking place in the fellowship hall. I'll tell you what's happening there in just a moment. We are in the midst of a series called All Together Now. And we are talking about the core value of our church, which is involvement today. So you might have already seen the buzz that's happening over there. But what this is about is that engaging in generous service, we do together what we could not do alone. That each of us brings something where all together the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's incredible what we can do together. And so in, in the spirit of this, there's a ministry fair that's happening right after this service all the way till 2 o'clock. There's food there that you can be a part of and eat and enjoy. There's also prizes and booths and you can get to know about all the ministries here. I can tell you from last night, starting at around 4 o'clock, people started setting s some stuff up. And I was blown away with how creative our body is, this church body because people were bringing in everything from canoes to blankets to flowers. You'll want to see what's happening over there. So please go by there after this service. One of those booths that you'll see is the music ministry. And Liesl Aquisapace is starting a cherub choir. So if you have kids or grandkids or neighbors that are age three to five, she's now assembling a new choir with the littlest voices that are just getting ready to practice, start practicing for Christmas. It's going to be adorable. So if you'd like to be involved with that, call the church office or get in touch with Liesl at the booth today with the music ministry. She would love to have your little cherub in the choir. We're coming up on our camp meeting Sabbath. Fall camp meeting is October 13 and 14. And we've invited a special guest with us, Ty Gibson. He's going to be talking with us about reimagining God. And we recognize and realize that there's baggage with the word God, uh, depending on our story, depending on our history. So he's going to be taking us on a journey through the word, um, being able to encounter the character of the living God again. So this is something you won't want to miss. Friday night it begins, the 13th. You can remember that one, right? Friday the 13th. Sabbath, we go into worship, and there's a special lunch that we can all stay for, for Haystacks. And then the afternoon, we will also have camp meeting. We've got some special musical treats planned and a really, really great, great time together for our fall camp meeting. This day, I'd like to invite special prayer for all of the people that you see listed in the bulletin. And in addition to that, we'd like to ask for your prayer for Haziel. You're going to see a picture of him. He's the kid to the right of his dad right there, going through a hard time right now and really especially needs your prayer for his health and wholeness. We'd also like to ask for your continued prayer for Kaylee Chinchai. She is being moved this next week uh, to another location where she will continue her recovery in Loma Linda, closer to her family. So we ask your continued covering of prayer over Luis and Blanca and Samuel as they continue on this uh, journey together of her recovery. We also ask that you continue to keep each one in prayer because it makes an incredible difference. To know that whatever we go through, we don't go through it alone matters. Uh, so please continue to lift each other up in prayer. At this time, I'd like to invite you to stand to your feet and reach to those in front of you, around you, behind you. A hug, a handshake, a high five to extend the love of God here in this place this morning.
That's cool. As we continue our worship, we are going to collect the Lamb's Offering, which goes towards our children's ministries. So boys and girls, if I could have you please looking around to folks that are holding up their offering for you to collect, we would like to um, have you help us with that. And we will sing while you collect the offering. And then Pastor Trevin has a special story afterwards for you. Do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed a light afar. To the many duties ever near you now be true. Christ in the corner where you are. Christ in the corner where you are. Christ in boys and girls. You guys look great this morning. Everybody good? Okay, good. Today, we're focusing on being involved. That means that we do our part, that we help out, that we do what we can do. And we're talking about how all of us here at the church have a part to play to help serve God and serve other people. And so I was thinking about stories that I know of kids especially who got involved, who used and did what they could to help other people. And the first story I thought of was the story of Naaman. Do you remember Naaman? He was a mighty warrior, but he ended up with leprosy. And no one had a cure for it. They couldn't figure out what to do. But Naaman's wife had a little servant girl. And she heard about this, and she told his wife, I know somebody that can help him. And it took a little while, and Naaman kind of resisted it, but eventually he went to the prophet Elisha. And the prophet Elisha told him, go bathe in the Jordan River, dip down seven times, and then you'll be healed. And Naaman kind of complained and grumbled, but eventually he did it, and Naaman was healed. It was all because of that servant girl 
telling his wife, hey, I know somebody that can help you. So sometimes we can serve and help God by telling others about God and telling others about Jesus. Maybe you can invite your friends in the neighborhood, bring them to church sometime. Maybe bring them to vacation Bible school next summer. Bring them to Sabbath school and show them how wonderful it is. And then I thought about the story of the five loaves and the two fish. Jesus was preaching and there were thousands of people there. And they're like, hey, everybody's getting hungry. What are we going to do? How are we going to feed them? They're like, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. But there was one boy who said, I have five loaves and two fish. If that can help, I'm willing to give it, give it. And so Jesus said, bring me the five loaves and two fish. And he blessed it and he fed the entire crowd with just that one boy's little lunch. Maybe one way you could serve people is to help people who are hungry. Do you, maybe do you know anybody in school where you see their lunchbox and there's not very much things in there because maybe they don't have much money? Why don't you ask your parents, hey, mom, put an extra bag of chips in my lunch so that I can share with my friend. Sometimes we can serve God in that way. But then I remembered a story that I heard about as well. Have you guys been paying attention to the news? There have been a lot of hurricanes that have happened recently, and like in Puerto Rico and Florida and Houston. A lot of people have lost their homes, and it's been really, really difficult. Well, several years ago in Haiti, there was a big earthquake, and lots of houses crumbled, and it was just really sad. And a boy in Michigan saw that story, and he saw a boy that was crying and really sad. And he said, I want to help this kid. What can I do to help this boy that's sad? And he thought, what brings me comfort when I'm sad? And he said, you know what brought me comfort when I was sad and a kid? A teddy bear did. And so he decided that he wanted to send teddy bears to the kids in Haiti. And so he told his school about it. And they said, oh, yeah, we'll announce it. Then the news found out about it. Guess what? He sent, he helped send 25,000 teddy bears to Haiti. 25,000 teddy bears to Haiti. And this is what he said. He said, it doesn't really matter how small or old you are. If you're young and think you can't make a difference in the world, well, actually, you can. All of us can make a difference in this world. And I want to encourage you to find ways that you can serve God and other people. It's going to look different for all of us, but we all have a part to play, and God can use each one of you. You guys have been great listeners. You can head back to your seats now. Five years ago, a group of us joined the Israel Hill Church. The church immediately embraced us and gave us the healing and love that we desperately needed. The first job assigned to me was to serve in the nominating committee. We are the Indonesian Sabbath school class. This year, our class is about 200 members strong. We love the church and we appreciate the pastoral leadership and the nurturing. We have representatives in the church board, finance committee, social committee, and church potluck. 10 of us are church elders and many are deacons. We serve as greeters and help out in the welcome center. Some of us who could sing joined the praise team and the church choirs. We participate in the worship service and communion service. Our members bake the communion bread. We pray with the members who have no partners during the food washing. We're involved with the community service, including the shut-in. We participate in fundraising. We thank the church for providing so many opportunities for us to get involved in the ministries we could serve best. Recently, Pastor Dante and Pastor Patty Marufo joined us to Indonesia in our Ambon mission trip. We introduced VBS to the island. 
we minister to more than 300 children and youth. It was quite a sight to see Pastor Patty stand among the children on the VBS graduation program. It was announced two Sabbaths ago by Pastor Tara that 116 candidates were baptized on that Sabbath, who was, uh, which was a record for the Maluku mission. Pastor Dante joined 14 other local pastors in the baptism. I noticed the interview of the candidate. Then the immersion. Then the rising out of the water. And then the heart. It was so typical of Pastor Dante. We thank the church for all the dedicated pastors and the church leaders. We especially thank the church members for supporting financially all the church projects. Today is a special day for us. Please visit the ministry fair in the fellowship hall and see what we have to offer. And then, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings you have given us. Thank you for the chance to participate in the church project. Bless this offering, for we pray in Jesus' name. God answers prayers. Nearly 
often immediately. When we are involved in the church ministries, do not be afraid to ask for an immediate answer for a specific problem. When we were in Ambon, we decided that our project Kids to Kids for the B VBS would be building a basketball court in our academy. Somebody suggested having a groundbreaking ceremony for the basketball court while we were there. I asked Pastor Patty whether we could have the 300-some kids to go to the groundbreaking area for the ceremony. She said, okay. So we arranged that our members and the accompanying adults would be the chaperones so the kids could safely march from the classrooms to the ground designated for the basketball court. I sure do not want any kids to fall into the hole that was uh, prepared for the event. Unfortunately, that morning it was pouring rain, big tropical rain, nonstop. We were planning to have the ceremony around 11.30. I had been in the mission compound since 7.30. After the morning worship, it was still raining. After the officer seminar, it was still raining. I was worried. It was raining hard. Then I prayed. If it was the Lord's will that we could have the groundbreaking that day, please he would let the rain stop so we could also include the kids for the ceremony. Immediately, the rain stopped just around 11.30. And the sun came up. I knew God answered my prayer. He's my best friend. You can see from these pictures how lovely the day was and we were able to have a wonderful, meaningful, groundbreaking ceremony for our project Kids to Kids. When we held hands and sang Blessed Be the Ties That Bind before the benediction, I thank the Lord for loving us. You may come forward just as you are and, re and present your request to the Lord. He will answer your prayer. Elder Gary Pace will offer the benediction. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us today. It's sunny outside, and we thank you for the gift of Sabbath, that we can come together and leave the stresses of the week aside and come and worship and fellowship together as a family. Even though the sun is shining outside, there are some who have dark clouds in their lives. Many of them have come up here to the front to lay their burdens at your feet. We ask you to give them comfort, peace, strength, wisdom to endure whatever it is on their heart. We especially want to pray for the brother of Jim and Deborah Hernandez, James, who is at the Lomonita Hospital fighting cancer. We ask you to put your arms around the family and your healing hand upon James. Lord, there are many of us who are sitting in our pews that have silent requests, burdens in our hearts, 
you know what these things are better than even we do. And we ask you, again, to give us the strength and the peace to know that you are, you are with us, you are in control of all things in this world and in our lives. We turn those things over to you. Lord, there's so many people in this world who are suffering right now, suffering from hurricanes, from earthquakes, from fires, from floods. Our hearts go out to all these people, and we just ask you to please strengthen them and encourage them as they're enduring great difficulties. Bless those who are actively trying to help and to alleviate the suffering of these people. Lord, we celebrate the ministries of this church. We are so thankful that we have a church that is willing to step out and meet the needs both of the people inside this church and the people outside of this church. There's so much darkness in this world, the world needs a light. Inspire us all to step out of our comfort zone and, and to take a part in these, these ministries. There are so many things that we can do, great and small. May we continue to be a light in this church and in this community. Lord, as we continue on in this service, Open our hearts, open our minds, send your spirit to impress us. Be with Pastor Tara as she speaks to us today. May her words be your words. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And may the prayer. found in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. This is the word of God.
Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Uh, the perfect words for connecting with each of our involvement in this body. Would you join me in praying as we open up God's word together today? Oh God, I thank you for this opportunity to worship together, to see, to gather, to sing to listen, and God, we're asking once more that as we pause right now, that you would unclutter our hearts, unclutter our thoughts, allow us to be present with you. May each one of us here know that we have been in your presence together when we leave this place. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, amen. Involvement. Engaging together in generous service, we can do together what we cannot do alone. I will never forget as a child the time that my brother and I were using a couple of screwdrivers to try to pound in nails. Now we were young, give us a break here. We were just taking, we were just pounding on my dad. <laughs> Oh, you use a tool what it's intended for. I remember that lecture very clearly just now. You use something for its intended purpose. Everything has a purpose. With that in mind, I invite you to watch a video that I saw first several years ago. It is in another language, but you don't need language to understand what's going on. Sag mal, Papa, habe ich dich noch gar nicht gefragt. Wie kommst du denn eigentlich mit dem neuen iPad zurecht, was wir dir zum Geburtstag geschenkt haben? Gut. Bei den ganzen Apps kommst du klar? Was denn für Apps? Geh mal bitte einen Schritt zur Seite. Half of you are laughing with me. Excellent. <laughs> Dad, how are you enjoying that new iPad we gave you? <laughs> oh, fine. Chopping. Everything, everything has a purpose, right? When we see something being used for outside of what's its intended purpose, especially if you might have paid a few hundred dollars for it, causes us to shudder. Some of you were doing like this, the water going on the iPad, I can't take it. It's important that we look at this topic of involvement because some of you feel like the iPad being used as a cutting board. You're not sure yet where you fit. Some of you don't know yet that what you have to bring makes a difference. Some of you don't yet realize today that we need all of us giving in the ways that we were intended to give to make the work of God here successful. Involvement says that by generously contributing my gift that we are able to do together what we could not do on our own. The church in Rome received a letter from Paul that talked about this very thing. With this image of a body, 
Paul vividly showed the interconnectivity between each person fulfilling their purpose and living that out in the context of a life together. Paul showed that we can do together what we could not do on our own when we live out of this purpose together. And it starts off individually, but then it moves quickly to community. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and we're actually gonna start in verse one. We're gonna move towards the text of our focus, but we have to start where this begins because the individual is connected to the community. Romans chapter 12, verse one says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. Your body, your day-to-day living is a living praise. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to attest and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Right from there, right from this conversation from the start about the renewing of the mind and the body as a living sacrifice, no longer something dying as a sacrifice, but something that is a day-by-day, minute-by-minute living sacrifice, he goes right into For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. You know what I find? We can be either too focused on ourselves or too... Uh, disinterested in ourselves. We're either, we either have everything that we need and we need no one, or we don't have anything to offer so we have nothing to give. And Paul says, view yourself with sober judgment that you know that you're not everything, but that you are something. You belong in this whole. And then he goes on to say, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Paul uses this description, this visual image of this body connected all together, this community that, though it is many, is united as one whole, diverse in all of its parts, but one body. Paul wasn't the first to use this imagery. When you start to go back and read, many ancient writers used this metaphor, this picture. They used it for the political state, that though we are one, uh, one body, we are made up of, of many. Another writer even said that the body, what, that the state was the body of the emperor. So think about how those believers were hearing this when they have heard that the head of the state was the head and here's this body that they are a part of carrying out the will of the emperor and now Paul uses this for the body of Christ. Paul was using the language and the imagery that was understandable to the people at the time but I see here also the divine mark of the spirit when he says in this letter that not only are we this body that is unified, but we are also this body that is the living body of Christ. When we get to Corinthians, to his letter there, Paul uses this imagery and and shows that he has deep roots in his theology because he says there that the body of Christ, when we take communion, is our Savior's sacrifice and gift but also this body of of Christ, the church. So as we come to the table, we receive the redemption and salvation, this gift that we all partake of together. We then are made into this connected community by this act of communion, that Christ lives through this body that as we are equally partakers of the benefits and gifts of Christ's redemptive work, that act causes us to become community, 
That act of Christ's body being broken makes us one body connected together as one. The church as a body, this metaphor keeps us grounded. We can't float off into just thinking that we're here to think the right things or to do all of these things up in another realm, but it grounds us because what do bodies do? Bodies need to sleep, they need to eat, they need rest, they need to drink, they need to move and breathe. So the church as a body grounds us in this place, Christ right here among us. This is ultimately what Paul is claiming here. The believers in Christ become his body in the world. We are inseparably joined to one another. This body with each of its members is manifest in the Christian community. We can no more separate ourselves from each other than the hand can say, I don't want to be a part of the arm anymore and separate itself from the rest of the body. Or that the arm can say, I don't need you torso and separate itself from the body. We are one whole. And so he compares this picture, this vivid image of the church on the move, collective, cohesive, joined together, though each different, becoming one body. He goes on to say from there in verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Paul shares this list with us about different gifts, different parts of this body that can be manifest in the church. So let's look at these for a moment. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament was about aiding the church in share and sharing the truth that was gained by revelation. Yes, this could have to do with the future, but more often what we see throughout the New Testament church is that the gift of prophecy was about interjecting and breathing wisdom into the present to give insight into current situations. I've experienced this here. Those words spoken in due time at the board meeting when someone verbalizes what needs to happen and we're all, yes, there's this gift of breathing wisdom into that setting. Or maybe you've had that experience when you share something and someone else speaks exactly what you need to hear right then. That can often have this prophetic quality that there's wisdom that God is blessing and giving and sharing with us through that gift insight into the present circumstances. You're talking about something crazy that's going on and someone else just says this and whoa, it's clearer now. If it's serving, then serve. The gift of serving can refer to the gift that all Christians must do in response to the greatest servant of all, Jesus Christ. But this word here is more limited. This word, diakoneo here, is, is about the role of the deacon. In Acts chapter six, it shows that the activities of the deacon are about organizing and providing for the material needs of the community. If you are called to this role, do it. If it is teaching, teach. To teach is to pass along the truth of the gospel. The teacher preserves the community by rooting and grounding them in the truth. I had the opportunity this week to sit in the presence of a great teacher. And as I was there listening to them, you know, when you're in the presence of a great teacher, you can't help but ask questions and get excited and not settle for the answers you would have stopped at before, but to just keep inquiring and keep growing. This gift of teaching grounds us. It keeps us from error, and it keeps us from settling for what we would just stop at earlier. If encouragement, then encourage. The Greek word here can mean to comfort, or to ex extort. This is the person that comes alongside you. 
This is a cheerleader or someone who comes up and you've had a really hard week and they come up next to you and they say, that was really rough, but you've got this. They come alongside and they say, you are called to this Christian life. You can live this. This person that comes close to you and gives you the encouragement that you need to keep going. Giving, give generously. Some other translations say, contributing to the needs of others, do so generously. This is someone who looks with sincerity, not forced love, but sees the need of someone else and gives from their heart. If leading, then do so diligently. Those gifted with leading, referring to the elders or other leaders in the congregation to rise up and give that visionary perspective of where things are called to be. If mercy, then do so cheerfully. Those among us who have this gift of mercy are those with a particular sensitivity to the needs of other people. You can see them, they're there with the sick, they're coming alongside the suffering, they're present, they notice what someone is going through. You who have that gift of mercy are needed to come alongside. This list of gifts and passions is not meant to be exhaustive. It doesn't include everything that, that was being experienced in Rome, but it also doesn't include what is being experienced here. But Paul is saying and underscoring, highlighting, he's saying whatever you have, use it. Whatever you've been given, use it. The body needs you. And as you use your gift we accomplish together what we could not do on our own. You see, there's this connection between what happens first in Romans 12 with chapter one, verse one and two, and then there's this connection with verses three to eight, that God can only do this process of renewing my mind by me being connected in the community. God is only able to see, I am only able to see how I can bring myself as a living sacrifice in connection with the community. You see, I need you and you need me in order to live out our sacrifice, to give our generous gift. In order to be renewed and transformed, we need the community. So Paul connects these two, this individual and this communal perspective with this vivid image of the body. He says we can do together what we could not do on our own. Now I've been reading a lot of great history and so two of the stories today come from these historical records because I'm moved by them. Maybe some of you saw this one in movie form, if you've seen the movie Amazing Grace. It chronicles the story of William Wilberforce and his actions in helping to end uh, slavery in England. And there were these great actions that he was a part of and that his life, his conversion, and his walk with God all played a part in how he joined this movement that made a difference in the lives of others. But what I was struck by was the unsung heroes. You see, when I started to look, I saw posters and I saw printed stories of people, slaves that had escaped, who shared their firsthand account and witness of what they had been through. And I saw the posters, are, am I not your brother? And I saw people who shared these stories with their friends and neighbors. I saw people that put this up in their shop and people who went shopping that refused to buy sugar because of the connection with the slave trade. And those thousands upon thousands of unsung heroes were what made the bigger picture possible. You see, we usually look at the, the great leader. We look at Wilberforce or we look at others, but we don't do anything alone. We don't do this alone. No leader, however great, does anything by themselves. It's always us. It's always a body. It's always those people connected together that cause the shift or the change or the movement or the salvation or whatever it is to happen. Through presence and participation, you make a difference. 
through your greeting, through your welcome, through your sacrifice, through your giving, it looks as different for each of us as our faces do. Our gifting is as different as we are, and that's the point, because together we are stronger. Together we experience the fullness of what God has been offering to us. We have a couple here in this church that always tells me, oh, don't get old, it's no fun. And I think some of us here today can agree with that, that feeling of maybe the age and stage that you're at is that it takes a lot of work to get up and it takes a lot of work to get here. Maybe you're at a different season of your life than you have been at before. Whereas you were the one that was giving and, and there and present all the time or you were giving in all of these different ways, but now the season looks different. Your presence is now your gift and it makes an incredible difference. All through our lives at different stages and seasons, our gift is going to look different. But Paul says, give that generous gift. Give what it looks like today. Give what you're called to now. And the whole body is blessed and healthy and benefits from that. I've also heard people say things like, people just don't seem to understand what I'm called to or, or this passion that I have for this. Maybe they don't understand because it's not theirs, it's yours. They don't have that in their heart because God put it in your heart. So live from that place. Live from that place of your calling that you have been called to, that God has put in you. When we talk about this issue of authority and who has the position of power, the body kind of has a very, very leveling quality to it because this brilliant thing about how the body systems come together is that each part does their role with authority, with sensitivity and grace to the rest, but as the body each functions in its own role and authority, it thrives. It not only stays alive, but it thrives by each part giving in its full self, its full role. You are an authority on your experience. You are a witness to what you have seen God do. You might say, well, I can't do that because look at all these other people that could do it better. No, you are the one who has witnessed what you've witnessed. Stand up and share what you've witnessed. You have authority over that because you have experienced that. Share from that place. You have that gift. Share from that gift. Live from your role and your calling and we are all blessed. So how? How do we know? How do we know what our place in the body is? What does it even look like to live in this system that connects all of us and allows us to live to our fullest? Well, some of you might be helped by this few questions that I'm about to ask. Some of you might write them down for someone else because you feel pretty grounded right now, or you might need to come back to these later. But some of you need to write these down and reflect on these today to talk with a friend and to share these. What are those things that most make you come alive? What are those things that cause you to come alive? Who are the people that you are most burdened for? If we were to sit together at lunch today, what subject or people group would cause you to lean in and want to tell me more? What makes your eyes light up? What do you see that makes you so angry you can hardly stand it? What do you do that makes you weary and spent, and yet makes you want to go back for more because it feels so worth it. These are some things that we can reflect on because there's something that's in you that we need. There's something that God's given you that we need. So our involvement core value is about the three C's. It's the only one that ended up like this way, so don't expect it for any of the other core values because we weren't looking at the letters until the end. We're like, those are the words we want, and they're all three Cs. So don't expect it for anything else. But the three Cs of involvement are contribute, collaborate, and celebrate. 
that you contribute and I contribute my generous gift, the unique gifting that we've been called to, that we collaborate, we don't do this alone, we are one body, and then we celebrate what God could do through all of us that we could not do on our own. So imagine this with me. Imagine what would happen if we all contributed from our passions, our gifts, and our burdens, and the season and stage that we were at right now. Imagine what would happen if all of us decided that we didn't want to just come to church, but we wanted to be the church, this body connected together, getting involved, maybe some for the first time in a long time, maybe some for the first time, period. Imagine if we all took a next step today. What if you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you as you go throughout the fellowship hall today, looking at each of these booths at the ministry fair, asking God to show you where you are called to contribute today. Now, maybe you're exactly where you are meant to be. I celebrate that. Maybe you're in the exact ministry that God has called you to. Amen, we're so glad that you're there. I would encourage you to share from your story then today because I guarantee you even now, the people around you, not everyone has had that experience of knowing I'm giving in exactly the way I'm called to. So share your story. Maybe you grab the passport card though and go around to the ministry booth so that you can enter to get one of these though because you might want a t-shirt. But then share your story. Share your witness. Share what God has done in leading you to that point of feeling deeply fulfilled in what you're giving and what you're offering. That might be your calling today. But imagine with me if we all contributed if we all practice that contributing and then collaborating in the places that we were called, the roles we are meant to fulfill. Let me tell you, it would be incredible to see that vision, the joy and the life and the energy of this body if each person was giving their generous gift. You know what I can imagine would happen is that some of you would be released from a burden of guilt that you've been carrying around because you've been trying to do everything instead of the thing that God has called you to do. So it might actually release you to be free to give what you're called to give right now. For some of you, it might cause you to lean in and to say, my gift is needed and valued and appreciated and I need to give it. For some of you, it might be a rethinking and reconfiguring because you've been the iPad used as the cutting board. You have a different way that is really within you to give. But imagine what that would look like if we were all contributing, collaborating together towards what this whole body could do. What we can do together is more than what we can do on our own. And the results have a saving impact. During World War II, there was this really, really challenging moment that the Allied troops faced. In this moment, there was, in the Dunkirk evacuation, there was this time that there was great fear because so many of the human resources and physical resources were completely surrounded and unable to move. And there was this tension of what was going to happen. How were they going to get out and, and evacuate those who were there because they were not able to press forward and break through the lines? So they started to wrestle with what this would look like and there was this joint effort that came together that was amazing. They called together all of these other private ships, civilian ships. They called together fishing boats and civilian merchant ships and yachts and lifeboats, and they assembled together. They had the air coverage by, by those who were up and protecting them from the air. They had the French who were a part of the allies that were fighting the ground battle bravely right there. 30,000 against 160,000. There was the ground, there was the air, and there was this motley crew assembled in the water. 
When they first came to this evacuation, they thought that at most they could save 100,000. 40,000 to 100,000 were the best guesses, but there were over 400,000 that needed to be evacuated. They didn't know how it was going to happen. No one thought it was possible. That's why this is called the miracle of Dunkirk. One US Army officer, George Fielding Elliott, wrote this. No purely military study of the major aspects of the war could do justice to the skill and the heroism of the evacuation from Dunkirk, one of the most motley fleets of, hi of history ever assembled, ships, transports, merchantmen, fishing boats, pleasure craft, took men off from the very few points that were left from the ocean, ocean beaches, for the German air attacks had virtually destroyed most of the port facilities. They were able to do together what they couldn't do on their own. Professionals and countrymen and people coming from all different places, different countries, different languages, different places in life, all coming together to join to make this evacuation possible. And what is so moving is that by the end, by the time they finished, Mar May 26th through June 4th, 1940, 340,000 people were able to be evacuated. Close to 340,000 people were brought safely back because of this joint effort from land, from air, from all of these varied boats coming together. They were able to do what they couldn't do on their own. If you see these, these pictures, these private boats right alongside the naval destroyers, it's, it's a moving sight to imagine what we are able to do together that we could not do on our own. Ordinary people responding in extraordinary ways. We cannot leave ministry to someone else. We cannot leave ministry to someone else that we feel is more qualified or more articulate or has more resources than us. You can't leave ministry to the professionals who have formal training. This calling is for the entire body. This calling is to all of us. Those bringing their sailboats, those fighting on the front lines, those from the air, those on the beaches, all of us together. If your gift is prophesying, speak that wisdom. If serving, serve. If teaching, then teach. If encouragement, then encourage. If giving, then give generously. If leading, then do so diligently. If showing mercy, do it cheerfully. If creating bulletin boards, do so creatively. If running media, do so with diligence. If welcoming people, do so with open heart and hands. If creating food so people can eat after service, do so with love in your heart. Whatever it is that you would fill in the blank with your generous gift, do it. We need it. This body needs it. As Brad Limerick said, God's calling for our life isn't a pot of gold to be found at the end of the rainbow. He wants us to simply use our gifts and our passions, and he's placed them in plain sight. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes what holds us back from giving is because it feels like so little compared to such great need. And our offering or our gift or our passion feels so small compared to what's needed. But you know, that's what's so great about a body is that it's not just me. And it's not just you, but it's us, all of us. And as we do this, as we lean in together, we are able to do together what we could not do on our own.
Let's all stand together as we sing. We hope this is going through your head throughout the week, that you have the mission and vision and these core values that are now echoing around in your mind throughout the week and getting stuck in your head in a good way. Um, I encourage you today, before you leave, uh, to go to the fellowship hall, to pray, to walk into that place and either support someone else or to lean into where God is calling you to give your generous gift. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, we are so grateful that you, God, have called us to not do this life alone, but to be the body of Christ. That we come and we experience your salvation. We come to the table, and God, through your sacrifice, we become one community. You're living and breathing and moving body in this world. And God, we need each other. Today, your Holy Spirit has been speaking to us. I trust that you are moving and have been moving among us. Today, for someone here, it might be a message of freedom to release them from the guilt of thinking of themselves in a previous stage that now they are in a different place, to give the gift that they can give now, or to give someone the freedom to realize their gift is appreciated, that they are called to give it. Or God, that you have been stirring and moving someone who's been disengaged or unplugged for a while, but is reconnecting and wanting to give and be a part of the body again. Whatever you've been speaking to us, whatever uh, freedom and joy and gift that you are calling us to, we want to be open. So God, as we leave this place, let us leave with an awareness of your movement in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>